Oh, I'm Jamie Elman, and you're watching You, Me, and YTV. Did you grow up in Canada? Were you alive in the 90s? Did you love YTV? Fuck yeah, you did! Today on the show, part two of our interview with YTV Dreamboat, Jamie Elman. We're going to talk about how the show ended, life after high school, the craziest thing a fan has ever done, and much more. So sit back, strap in, and do not miss this exciting episode of You, Me, and YTV. Now, if you can just shift into hyperspace to get the four other cartoons finished, we'd have an issue. Oh, good. Pressure. I respond to it so well. By the way, do you even draw? I, no. Not only do I not draw, it got to a point where the kids, you know, like especially the younger ones, um, that would come up for autographs. They wanted me to draw, and they were disappointed that I didn't draw. So I had Alan Silberberg, who's one of the co-creators of the show. Uh, hey, Alan. Um, he uh, he's a phenomenal artist and um, animator, and so he taught me like literally make a happy face just so I could draw something for them. And it's like the only thing that I knew how to draw then or now, but I still can draw it. I never, I never, I never drew, but I, it's amazing how many people ask that. So I guess I made it look like I was drawing it, but they always had, you know, there was different versions when you'd see the inserts of, sometimes it was just a black and white one and I would be, you know, coloring in one section of it and they would match cut that to the animated stuff or there'd be a mostly finished one and I would just be filling in one line or something and they made it and they sold it, but I, I, I have no idea how to do that, no. All right, well, speaking of things you do know how to do, um, Jessica Goldapple, who played Flash on the show, my favorite character. No offense to dudes, but... I don't blame you. Flash. <sighs> I'm starving. Buy me dinner. I'm not really in the mood. <laughs> of course, you gotta eat. <laughs> I was saying, hey, what can I embarrass Jamie with? She's like, I never want to embarrass him. But one of my favorite moments was when he sang an Emily the Valentine's Day song. And I was like, oh, yeah, right, I remember him singing something. Okay, here goes. Emily, I wrote this for you. In my research for this interview today, I was looking it up, and uh, you were about to sing, and in my head, I'm just like, I can't remember if he's good at it or bad. And in my head, I had a flash of Milhouse's dad singing Can I Borrow a Feeling on The Simpsons. Oh, boy. Can I borrow a feeling? Could you lend me a jar of love? Hurting hearts need some healing. And then I listen and you're just like, damn, he's really good. Oh girl, how can you forgive me after all that I have done? Is it that I've shown? And then I'm like, oh, they're not showing his hands. Maybe he's not really playing piano. But then they show back up, you are playing piano. So were you singing and playing piano? Um, yeah, this was, you want to talk about life imitating art, imitating life imitating art. The crew had a blues band, okay? The, the, I think he was the transportation captain. This guy, Steve, he still plays around Montreal. Sick blues guitar player. And uh, as always on the cruise, a bunch of the guys are musicians. And I heard them jamming once and I was like, I play blues piano. I want to sit in with you. And so sure enough, I brought my electric piano to the rap party and spent like half the rap party on stage with them, jamming and having the time of my life. The producer did not know that I play or that I sing. And so they said, okay, we're gonna write that into the show. And they wrote this episode where Cody ends up serenading Emily. And they hired a guy to write a love song mm. for them. And they played me the song and it was okay but I didn't love it, and we didn't have a ton of time to work on memorizing it. So I kind of thought about it, and I had written a love song for my high school girlfriend <laughs> okay. a few years earlier. Yeah. I went to the girl who I had been dating, that I had written it for, and I asked her if she would mind if I used the real song. And she said no. And I went to the producers and said, okay, I can learn your song, which I'll have to fake play, which I, I, I don't know how to do that. And I'll sing this thing, which is a little bit on the nose and whatever. Or, and I played Judy, who is the, one of the other co-creators of the show. I played her this love song called Boy and Girl that I wrote for my girlfriend, Karen, in high school. 
And she was like, boy yeah, girl. yeah, it's called Boy and Girl. We, we pre-recorded it so that I could fake play it yeah. um, on the day and sing it live or maybe even fake play it and lip sync it. And we had that as a backup. But I asked the director specifically, is there a way to do it where I actually play it and sing it live? Because it, it's, it's, it's hard to do that. It's hard to lip sync while performing, while, you know, fake playing and, and the way they have it, they have these things called earwigs that you put in your ear. And so I'm listening to the recording and trying to time my hands and trying to match exactly the way I sang it on the track. So I think we shot it like that. And then once we got it, they just rolled real sound on it and turned the piano on for real and let me sing it for real. And I'm pretty sure that what's in the show is the live take of this actual live song that I, that I wrote for my girlfriend. Because I had gone into the studio to record that, I actually got to do a professional recording of the song, and I, I think I still have it. I have the actual CD somewhere. That put I it on iTunes, man. Uh, but as Cody Miller. I maybe. <laughs> I, I never. I never thought of that. Over the years, people have mentioned that to me, like they remember the song. And um, I think on Valentine's Day a couple years ago, maybe I posted a link to the song on Facebook or something like that. But. I don't know. If enough people respond to this, then maybe I'll dig it out of the uh, grave, out of the archive, and post it somewhere. It's been sitting somewhere for 20 years, so maybe it should go. So I don't know. All right. Uh, Ross was telling me how all Canadian shows have a certain amount of episodes they want to make so they can syndicate, and they kind of just pull the plug. Based on anything, they're just like, okay, we made it. Let's not, let's not make more seasons than we have to. Um, did you guys know the third season would be your last season going in, or did it come as a horrible, uh, sad surprise? Good question. Um, don't remember that well. I guess we knew that there's this magic number, which is 65, um, and that if you, uh, if, you, if you hit 65 episodes, you can strip the show, which means put it on five days a week, Monday to Friday, sell it as a library, they make their money back, and that's it. Um, I assume we knew it was likely the end because the ending episodes were very specific endings, things, you know, where there was... Um, college talk. Yeah, co talk of college. There was the last episode we did was the reunion, so we imagine ourselves, you know, 25 years in the future. We did Jessica brought that one up, too, where they aged you. Amazing. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Hey. Wow, you look... Great! <laughs> yeah, that was like, the, the, the final episodes were really fun. We knew it was the end. I mean, maybe we thought that there was a chance or something, but I, I, I'm pretty sure we, we knew it was the end. So we did some cool things. It was like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer spoof episode. We did this one called Dead Men Don't Go to Edison, which was the black and white film noir tribute. She also brought that one up, too. A fantastic. We had the costumes. <laughs> Trying to get rid of us in an awful hurry. Sugar, hiding something? And what could I possibly be hiding? Yeah, they went all out. I think we just blew the budget for the final episodes or something. Um, and yeah, that reunion episode was amazing because we all had this prosthetic makeup and my bald cap and, you know, Mark Taylor, Romeo, was wearing this huge fat suit and it was hilarious. And the dialogue, I mean, by that point, even in earlier than that, they had really tapped into our real personalities, our real sense of humor. They were willing to do more sophisticated jobs. I mean, to do a film noir episode for an audience that is ostensibly, what, 11 to 15 years old? Sure, we knew that there were 18 years old watching it at college. We knew there were the drunken stone 20-somethings watching it. Um, but it's fairly sophisticated to do, you know, to do something like that. Um, uh, references to the X-Files, phallic references to you know when when Cody imagines the 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 Washington monument and the phallic I mean they did some <laughs> some wacky shit Welcome to Holly's lingerie fashion show I'm your hostess Kim who is also wearing next to nothing for your viewing pleasure <laughs> Canadian clean is American dirty Uh yeah, yeah I think yeah. so I think so I mean they weren't 
prudish about a bunch of things that I would not have flown, I think, in the States. And so, yeah, I don't think it was a, a, a shock that it was over. And we were, but it was, I'd say, upsetting and annoying because we knew we were coming to the end of like a very special experience. And I'm happy that I remember distinctly saying at the time to the guys when we'd like walk into the dressing room and maybe it was the dead of winter and it was six in the morning and it was cold and it's like you were really tired and wanted to still be in bed and stuff like that. We were always saying things like never complain. This is the greatest thing. This is this will remember this forever. It's going to fly by. And, you know, we never had any illusions that like this this could last forever and and we knew how lucky we were in the moment you know sometimes it takes some hindsight and looking back on it but we knew at the time that this is this is badass that we even you know even if no one had ever seen it mm. that's what i'm saying because you know for the audience out there audience thank you for enjoying those uh those 65 22 minute episodes all on youtube right now all on youtube I'll post a link underneath this. I'll post a link underneath this. <laughs> but for us, it was two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 15, 16, 17 years of friendship that followed it. So That's a beautiful it, thing. It, it was. It still is. Um, besides the guys on the show, uh, do you ever keep in touch with the girls? Yeah. Um, some more than others. Jess uh, Goldapple lives in L.A. She's awesome. She is an awesome human being. She agreed to be on the show. She's like my favorite human being in the world yes, right now. <laughs> yes. No, she, she is, uh, she's a brilliant person. Um, we lived together also during the run of the show. We were roommates and it was... Platonically or...? Uh, yes, platonic roommates and... Uh, but there could have been the the sitcom that we shot in our apartment. It was it was, you know, ridiculous fun. We 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 really got along very well right away. By the way, nice jammies. <laughs> we grew up around the corner from each other, um, and we just clicked like uh, you know I don't know what. And um, so we we became very very close friends. And then she moved to L.A., and so we, we keep in touch, and we're still good friends, and I'll always love her. And uh, I was her counselor, or like she likes to point out, her drama teacher, drama counselor at a summer camp when I was about 15, 16, 17. She was like 12. Mm. So I've known her for um, like, like 25 years. And the other girls, uh, a little bit, a little bit. Um, uh, Jen Finnegan who plays uh, Kim on the show, who played my girlfriend last season. She also lives in L.A. Um, and uh, whenever we see each other, it's always, you know, great. And, and she's hilarious, and she's a Montrealer. Um, and she's married to a great guy, Johnny, who I also love. So, you know, we, 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 do, we do keep in touch. And Victoria, I've seen. And, um, Victoria, also very awesome. Very awesome, yeah. very awesome girl, very talented. I mean, that's the thing. They were all really cool people and that's why it was great like i don't know what other teen sitcom actors necessarily inspired this kind of real life bond because i don't think jennifer aniston invite any of her cast members to her wedding like mm, it just mm. seems like there's this uh separate dressing room in a metaphorical way and a in a very literal way too but with you guys it just seems like it seems like you had this 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 golden experience, you know, that not a lot of people have. That's actually, it's inspiring. Because then next time I watch this show, I'm like, wow, they're not just good actors. They're, you know, they're obviously good friends. And It was sort of the best case scenario. I mean, everything had to align as always in life for something like that to happen. But our ages, where we were in our careers, the fact that some of us were Montrealers and some were Toronto, but they came in and it was just, Montreal's a great city and, you know, we shot in the summer and went out together and, and a lot of firsts for a lot of us in terms of, you know, being recognized from TV and getting to do some fun things and, you know, go to, to it flew us to L.A. for a couple nights to give a speech at this thing. And then, um, you know, New York and went to like the Mall of America <laughs> in um, Minneapolis, I think. And um, just a, a lot of firsts that that we all got to experience together. It was very exciting. And um, and because of the people involved, there wasn't a lot of ego on anybody. It wasn't like there was, sure, Ross was a superstar in his own mind, um, and maybe in ours at the beginning, but we, uh, we, we, we took him down a peg. 
Yeah, buddy, we did. Um, and he took us down to, we, we all kept each other kind of grounded. And because it wasn't this Jennifer Aniston separate dressing room thing, like, yes, if we had had our own trailers, if we had had our own dressing rooms, if various other things had happened that we didn't shoot in this actual high school without the audience there fawning over us and signing autographs, it was all happening in this little bubble in the East End of Montreal where even the crew wasn't, you know, starstruck or something, or not, not that they would be do, doing a show, but there was nothing like that. We were, we were all in it together. It was a team. It was an équipe, tout ensemble. And uh, sharing the dressing room was part of it. Like, yeah, it's like, who gives a shit? Would you? Sure, they, they, they would poke fun occasionally at my, um, you know, being number one on the call sheet, you know, number one. Like in Star Trek Next Generation, they would make that reference, number one. Um, and, uh, uh, but we'd bust each other's balls and, uh, and had a really, really, like you said, a golden experience. Yeah, like the outsiders, you know, gold, stay gold, stay, stay gold, gold oh. Shepherd. All right, so there is life after high school, mm-hmm. and you've had, according to your IMDb, you've had quite yourself a career. In fact, the other day, which inspired me to re-message you about being on the show today, I was watching a little show called Mad Men, mm-hmm. and then up on the screen is a handsome young man that I recognize, and I said, what the hell is that, Jamie? My father's extremely concerned about the business right now. Dad is worried that everyone who's ever going to buy a raincoat already has one. Yeah. And I look on your IMDb, and yes, it is. Yes. You've, you've done many things, and people, you know, you don't have to list them all. People can check out Jamie Ullman on IMDb. But um, something of note is that you have a web series you do that's based out of Montreal called Ye- Ye Life Crisis, which 80 to 90 to almost 100% of it is act in y- Yiddish. Yes. How the hell did you think of this? Uh, Yid Life Crisis is uh, the brainchild of me and my buddy Ellie Battalion, who's a fellow Montrealer, fellow graduate of Bialik High School, where we did learn Yiddish for a few years. And uh, I don't speak it very well. I can understand it. I can read it a little bit. But uh, Ellie's is better. And we always wanted to work together and have a very um, similar uh, sort of sense of humor. And so a few years ago, we found out about a grant that was being offered by the Jewish community, the Federation here, to create Jewish content, it's an artist grant. And he said, let's make, let's do something in Yiddish, because Yiddish, we thought, would lend itself to comedy, because um, basically a lot of American comedy, our thesis is that American comedy as we know it is fundamentally Jewish. And uh, uh, a lot's been written about this. A lot's been said about that. We're not the first ones. Larry to David say this. certainly thinks so. What's your name? Jamie. Jamie. Yeah. Okay. Jamie, nice to meet you. Nice okay. to meet you. I'm gonna go say a little something to Mr. Dan. Please don't. In a Please few don't minutes, say anything you're to not Mr. Be Danson. wearing a bow tie. I, I don't that. mind. I don't mind wearing it that much. And I'd rather you don't. Me. You're gonna come up and say, Larry. Thank you for getting rid of my bow tie. I thank you, Larry, to, to not. Yeah. Well, Larry is a descendant of you know Mel Brooks and Carl Carl Reiner. Who's a, who are descendants of Jackie Mason. And so we, we wanted to pay tribute to the Jewish comedians that came before us by doing stuff that is generally, we think, performed in English, but with this Yiddish sensibility, and we're just going to do it in Yiddish. So that was kind of the idea behind it. And then there's all sorts of... Well, deeper. The, pre- the premise of the show is that you're the one that's always kind of on the outs of Jew- complete Jewish traditions and the other character is the complete Jewish traditionalist. Right, right. So it's a sort of classic age-old argument about faith versus not faith, ritual versus law, community versus being outside of the community, um, religiosity versus secularism. I'm making it sound maybe pretty heady, which parts of it are. And it sort of took off a little bit and we ended up uh, doing it for the last two years. We do live shows that we've brought across Canada and the States and even to Europe. And um, we uh, had some success with a few episodes where we managed to get some star cameos, including from Canadian comic icon, Howie Mandel. Hey, Hey, Howie, yes, good. Good, do you, uh, you, you know any Yiddish? I uh, versteist a, a bissel. Oh, yeah. right on. And, and uh, Blossom. And Blossom, for you, uh, for those of you old enough to know who that is. And for those who are not, it's Amy from The Big Bang Theory. That's it, Amy Fairfowler. 
a.k.a. Mayim Bialik, um, who does speak uh, some Yiddish, and so she was great to work with. Ich glaube, wir haben zwei Schmendereckes, die es meinen, dass ich nicht kein Jiddisch rede. Und Pater in unserer Zeit. I'll call you back. That was the only episode that we shot in L.A., but um, all the rest of them were shot here in Montreal. And uh, it's just been a great experience, and we continue to do sort of live hybrid versions of this and make new episodes. And um, How do the live versions work if the audience doesn't know how to speak Yiddish? Uh, good question. Basically, it's a hybrid screening and live thing. So the screenings are in Yiddish with the subtitles, and then we do our shtick in English, although we occasionally sort of teach the audience a little bit of Yiddish. Yeah. Um, but the important thing to note about that and about the play that I'm starring in right now, which I'm about to go warm up for, is that it's not all for Jews, that we are telling our stories through Jewish lenses because that's what we know. But in fact, it's extremely universal themes about how to honor your parents and your grandparents and what should you preserve from older generations and how important is memory and how are you going to live your life in light of you know everything that happened before you. So it, it, they're universal shows and they are uh, hopefully both very funny and poignant. Uh, no, I can't do oh. it! Oh. On my bris day. So, right before we wrap up, I guess the last question I have for you is, what is the weirdest thing a fan's ever done besides create a show called You, Me, and YTV and uh, talk about the old days? Like, what's a weird thing a fan's done? I mean, quite honestly, the thing that just popped into my head is that um, a long time ago, like... Uh, probably 15 years ago, 14 years ago. Yeah, almost 15. I drove across Canada with my buddy Jeff. And I believe we were in Moose Jaw. And it was like my birthday. And um, I went up on stage at this virtually empty bar where this band was playing music. And I wanted, and we got drunk, basically. And I got on stage and I asked the band if I could sing a song with them. And they said, what do you want to sing? And I said, Tragically Hip. So I sang Blow It High Doe. And we were in, you know, we were in Moose Jaw. And this was now, you know, a couple years after we had finished making the show, maybe a year and a half or two years after finishing the show. And I got off stage and a bunch of people recognized me as Cody and invited me back to their uh, house party. To draw for everybody. Well, she wanted me to draw this <laughs> one woman. And, and, and I said, I don't know how to draw. And she was like, well, then at least give me an autograph. And I said, sure. And she pulled down her shirt, and I actually signed her breast. And that was probably the highlight autograph of my uh, Cody career. <laughs> All righty, then. Thanks, everyone, for watching and listening to you, me, and YTV. You can check Jamie and the play Bad Jews for the next couple of weeks here at the Siegel Theater. And... Um, Thanks again for watching. We're going to have more Student Bodies uh, cast members on the show. Jessica Gold Apple's coming up next. And um, I, I'm going to go after Mick now. Go, go after him hard. Okay, I'm going to go after him hard. I'm going to be like, we're going to talk about that drunk episode for yeah, oh two yeah. hours. Oh, yeah, I'll put a word in for you. Don't worry about that. All right, he thanks. Me. All right, thanks, everyone, for watching. We, I appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today, folks. Thank you, Jamie Elman, for being so awesome. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and tell all your friends that 90s Nostalgia is still live on You, Me, and YTV.